All right. Welcome back. Laura McIsaac, so happy to have you here. Um, we spoke in a prior episode about first trimester bleeding, but in this episode, I uh, wanted to talk to you about um, what to do if someone is having either a miscarriage or abortion. There's what I think the one thing you told me that really stuck with me, correct me if I'm wrong, is that of all pregnancies in the US, a quarter of them will be miscarriages and a quarter of them will be abortions. Um, and essentially mm -hmm. the miscarriages and abortions are miscarriages and I guess medical abortions are basically indistinguishable. It's the same physiologic process. Exactly. And I, I think that what's important for ER doctors is that medication abortion has really gone up in the U.S. So it's FDA approved for women who are 10 weeks gestation or less. So this is just 10 weeks or less. It used to, the drugs to do a medical abortion have been approved for 22 years, but really it's in the last like three, four that women have chosen to do the pills instead of a procedure yeah. has just shot up. So right now in the US, it's about 54% of women who choose to have an abortion will choose the pills. And it was like 10% five years ago. So because more, because abortion's common, miscarriage is common, you will see it in the ER, and abortion is common, and now more women choose the pills. And so they will come to the ER for reassurance or if they think something's going wrong, because really the pills are the patients managing her own induced miscarriage at home. So yeah. there's a lot more uncertainty. Some of them end up in the ER. Okay, so let's talk about in the scenario where in the ER we're seeing a patient and there could be various ways that the scenario comes about that we know that they're either having a miscarriage or they're having a medical abortion. Either they took the pills for the medical abortion and they're coming into us. Another scenario is they had an ultrasound by an OB and they saw there was an intrauterine pregnancy. Now they're coming in with a couple of days of bleeding and we look and we don't see anything in there or we see schmutz in there. Mm -hmm. Another scenario is first time ultrasound for you know cramping, bleeding. We see a pretty well-developed embryo without a fetal heart rate. So not like an early embryo that maybe we just can't see the heart rate yet, but maybe we're seeing like a nine, 10 week um, fetus and there's no heartbeat there. I'm thinking those different things all lead to the same conclusion that this is heading towards miscarriage. Um, are there hey. any scenarios in which in the ER, we could confidently say someone is going to be term, you know, this pregnancy will be terminated. Yeah. In all of those, it's this, the history is really helpful. And I, I see sometimes my residents even forget this is to really ask the patient, you know, how pregnant are you based on your period and are your periods regular? Cause that helps you have confidence that their menstrual dating is accurate. And also were you taking any birth control? Because if people have been on the birth control pills and they get pregnant, then you may not really, their, their estimation of their gestational age may be really off. So taking a, a good menstrual history to figure out how pregnant they think they are. And then have you had an ultrasound in this pregnancy? And they often just don't offer it right away and if they have your job is so much easier because then they say no I'm, i had a sono two weeks ago and they I, they show me and sometimes they have a picture on their phone right so it's easy for you and they're like oh it looked like that two weeks ago and today it looks like this mm -hmm. okay this is a miscarriage this is not viable okay so just those are all really right off the bat questions that will help you figure out if this is a miscarriage in process or did you take anything to terminate the pregnancy. I think we could have a little side conversation about that because so many states now restrict abortion that women may feel worried about reporting, taking the medical abortion pills. Right. And so given, depending on where, where this care is happening, I think that's gonna be a whole other conversation. Basically, and you then, wanna make sure you're not missing an ectopic. Yeah. Because so if I'm using history alone, because right. basically you're using history alone, you're not using serial betas and serial sonos. Yeah. yeah. So usually you can, but you got to really ask the questions um, pointedly. Like, yeah. 
when was the sono? What did it look like? Did they say this is definitely a uterine pregnancy? How far along? And if all that's clear, you're good. Okay. Then, and now you say, and then the patient says, I've been bleeding like a period since yesterday, cramping and bleeding, like a light period, a couple to, uh, for a few hours, it felt heavier. And, you know, am I miscarrying or uh, have I miscarried? And is it finished? That's why a lot of people will show up in the ER. It's not life or death hemorrhage. It's not, there's nothing, there isn't really an emergency clinically. It's, they want to know what's happening. So your ultrasound shows no gestational sac, maybe some decidua, that's the schmutz we call it, which is just kind of debris that's, you know, the decidua is the lining of the uterus that fluffs up to receive a pregnancy. So even when the sac has passed out, there's still some decidual lining that sometimes takes a little longer for the uterus to cramp more and, and pass that extra tissue. Um, but what we want to, here's a kind of a really good clinical pearl is that you don't need to treat the ultrasound picture. You treat the patient. So you know it wasn't ectopic. You know the sac has now passed out. What do you need to do? If she's symptomatic, like you still see red blood, you did a vaginal scan, you take it out, there's a lot of blood. So she's still bleeding and cramping. Vaginal scan, you mean you did a pelvic exam? No, a vaginal ultrasound probe. You had to do that to see an empty uterus. Oh, oh and so, you take, there's blood on the probe. There's a lot of blood. Okay. So she's not, so she's actively miscarrying. The yeah. sac has passed, but she's still bleeding quite a bit and maybe and cramping. So she's in the mid, she's at the three quarters of the way through her miscarriage because the sac is gone, but she's still symptomatic. So you can treat her with either offering her misoprostol. I mean, she has three choices. We'll do nothing. You're miscarrying. You can go home and this bleeding will probably resolve. The cramping will resolve. Here's some suggestions to make it more comfortable. Here are the um, flags that you need to come back because the bleeding what, is- What are the suggestions to make that more comfortable? Yeah, uh, NSAIDs. And often people underdose themselves, you know, for our yeah. treatment for dysmenorrhea is 800 milligrams. So four Motrin, Advil, ibuprofen tablets. Um, every it's 800 every eight hours or 600 every six mm. is the max for 24 hours. And they're much better than Tylenol for the uterus. So treating the cramps, um, heating pad isn't really evidence-based, but it is comforting. So <laughs> I've seen the response, but we don't really have good data for that. Uh, one of our fellows did a study about tens and that's it. Okay. Okay. So if you see this miscarriage in process you're yes. gonna say one option you can do is just continue the process at home and we can help you with to try to make the pain more bearable mm -hmm. okay what are, and what are, here's what here's when you have to come back because right. occasionally some of the tissue just gets stuck in the cervix and the cervix stays open and you just get ongoing bleeding not you know most sabs and most medical abortions happen just fine like for medication abortion, it's 98% successful. But every once in a while, the tissue doesn't all pass and it just gets you know, in the wrong place, keeping the cervix open and keeping the uterus trying to contract and trying to expel it and they keep bleeding. So you have to say, if your bleeding persists, then I want you to come how back. Long? Like how long? Yeah. Is it? So too much bleeding is soaking through two pads and you ask them not to use tampons because it's harder to see how much you're bleeding. So to use pads, so you can visualize it. And if you soak through two pads in an hour, two hours in a row, that's brisk bleeding that you should come back for. But that's uh, too much bleeding. That's how we quantify it. It's not great, but it's what we use, what everyone sort of uses. So that's too um, much, but how about too long? Like what if two weeks from now they're still bleeding? Is that okay? or? So that actually is not unusual for a medication abortion person to be bleeding lightly on and off for two weeks. That's just an SAB or a medical abortion. So I can do that. Mm -hmm. But it, so that's why you get a lot of ER visits is people yeah. are like, it's been seven days and I'm still yeah. like, it's not pouring out. I'm not scared that I'm going to hemorrhage. I just don't know if this is normal. Right. And it, it, it's not.
um, great for the patient because the uncertainty, but it is normal. Okay. And if you spike a fever, because occasionally with miscarriage, if the cervix is open for longer, you can get a uterine infection and you want to treat those early because you just want to protect future fertility. Okay. So I, so fever, bleeding too much, d- too much quantity, not too many days, um, then you need to come back and, and then hopefully give them some ongoing GYN care yeah. for contraception or primary care. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now the patient says, well, I'm in the middle of my miscarriage. I don't want to go home and just let it all resolve on its own. I want you to finish it now because I'm too nervous. Um, you have two options. You can give them the medication, misoprostol, the trade name, Cytotec, which is a prostaglandin. It's really a safe one. It doesn't constrict the coronary vessels or the pulmonary vessels. So it's it's just very safe. And it's a, it's a prostaglandin E1 analog, and it makes the uterus contract. So this woman's in the middle of a miscarriage. If you can give her a little bit extra prostaglandin <clears throat> to make the uterus contract just a little more aggressively, you might expedite the end of her miscarriage. Okay. She'll still have to go home though. And, and it, it doesn't, you don't keep her in the hospital, right? Cause it takes a day or two, but you might just shorten the end of her miscarriage. So the bleeding and cramping, the whole resolution will be quicker. What's the, what's the dosage you would give for that? It's 800 micrograms. Okay. There's different ways to give the medication. Like we don't give it or vaginal. Yeah. Or, okay. And the reason we don't give it orally is that the GI side effects are too much. People th- throw up. If you give, if you want a high enough dose to hit the uterus well, those higher doses that really work on the uterus are not tolerated um, when taken orally. So buccal, and it's absorbed from the buccal mucosa or from the vagina. But if someone's in the middle of their miscarriage and they're kind of bleeding a lot, um, you just don't feel like putting the tablets in the vagina. You're worried it'll just come out with a blood clot. So the buckle's the best. Two, two tablets in each cheek and you wait 30 minutes and whatever hasn't resolved, uh, sorry, dissolved, then they can drink some water and swallow the little bit that's left because that's not a high enough dose to make them nauseous and throw up. Okay. And you can give it to them to take at home too. And it doesn't have to be in the ED if you have a if you can give it to them for home use, yes. which is just a logistics issue. Now, are there, um, any, are, are there any contraindications or things to, to think twice about before giving this? Like in these patients, you shouldn't do it or? Uh, no, okay. not for the prostaglandins. Okay. This prostaglandin, it's. Okay. All right, so that's option two. Mm-hmm. Option three is a suction aspiration procedure, which you can do in the ER if people are comfortable with it, including the patient. Um, or, but that means just local anesthesia, where you give a paracervical block in the cer- into the cervix. Probably the most useful decision tree here is if the cervix is open at all, and you don't need to dilate the cervix because she's in the process of miscarrying. So the cervix is open a little bit. You can see that if you've just done your vaginal scan, ultrasound, to see the uterus is empty, you can off, if you can find the cervix, you can see that it's open. And that's when you can sort of say, your cervix is open, you're, you're, you're in the process of miscarrying, most of the tissue's out, there's only a little bit left. Your uterus will finish this job on its own at home. You'll be fine. If, that's, if you want me to give you a medication to maybe finish that off a little quicker, you can choose the misoprostol. The third option is a procedure. So I, so I guess the difference would be if the patient's really bleeding a lot, we're heavy, bright red blood, not you know the darker red blood that's been sitting in the uterus for a little bit, but it's kind of pouring and you can see that it is coming from the cervix. And on your ultrasound, you're like, okay, the cervix is open. There's that little bit of tissue there. She's really bleeding. I'm not sure I want to send her home with mm-hmm. me- the medication or you know, ob- observation. Yeah. Then I would, Just get so she'd done. have to be symptomatic enough to yeah. intervene because the process really happens naturally fine almost all the time. Okay. So symptomatic, do a suction.
<clears throat> when I check a hemoglobin, let's say I know the patient's baseline hemoglobin, and I always I tend to check a CBC now. I've seen some pretty dramatic drops in the CBC, not to the point where I feel like I need to transfuse, but what do you see as an acceptable amount of hemoglobin drop for this process? Mm, so that's pretty subjective. Uh, I would probably base it on clinical symptoms, not really a number. So if patient's orthostatic, okay. then I would A, do the suction, finish the process fast, in my hands, you know, you call GYN or some of the ER doctors know how to do the manual vas vacuum aspiration right there in the right. ER procedure rooms. There's no number that we either transfuse or, you know, keep them for observation. It's yeah. really, it's orthostasis, it's Sim hemodynamic stability. Okay. But even if they were under, if they were seven or under, you would not necessarily transfuse them if you fix the under, you know, if you did the procedure. The bleeding is totally over and she's asymptomatic. You, would you know, like and I guess it, it, maybe if she makes sure she has a, like a home to go to, to build her crib yeah. back up. Yeah. yeah. See, I, yeah, I think that's interesting because I've always found OB to be so much more flexible with their hemoglobins than any other specialty. And it makes sense. We're dealing with younger patients and we know the cause and we stop that cause. So I guess it makes sense. A lot of patients want you to just look at their uterus and say, it's at your, you've had a miscarriage, your uterus is empty, your bleeding is slowing down it's or stopped, you're done. And your future fertility is uh, completely the same as it was before this pregnancy. People who've had one miscarriage are at a higher risk of having another but most of those are spontaneous events, right? They're genetic abnormalities in development. So it's an independent, spontaneous event. Um, so, and importantly then also ask, do you want me to give you some contraception before you go home? Because many people are unaware at how quickly your fertility returns. Okay, so that's good to know there's no there's no reason not to start contraceptives pretty much no. even during that day. Yes. During yep. okay. Right. And then I guess the one thing is to check their blood type, right? Because until ACOG really changes our recommendations, if the patient doesn't know her blood type, sure. she would have to check her blood typing offer to give her Rogam. Right. Okay. So we're going to do a CBC probably. I mean, just knowing us, we probably do that. We'll probably do a type screen, potentially give Rogam, have a conversation. I know, in, as you said in a prior episode, that in Europe, they're not really doing that in the first trimester, but in the US, still kind of standard of practice. Um, yeah. The question I have is, at what point um, can in the progression of the pregnancy, like, yeah, I get first trimester, probably this is a spontaneous, it, it can happen on its own. But at what point do you say like, this has progressed too far? And at this point, the miscarriage does need some help. And then, you know, mm. like, is it, I'm just making this up, but is it like, okay, at 15 weeks, you know, it's not just going to work on its own, you need a procedure or something like that. Yeah. If you don't have surgical options, then everyone gets the medicine and you can get the fetus to pass, have a miscarriage. But there are more complications of incomplete where it doesn't, all the tissue doesn't come out. And that, that inflection point is about 12 weeks. So, so in, second trimester. Right. So in the UK, mifi, mifepristone and misoprostol are approved for 12 weeks and WHO supports 12 weeks because up to 12 weeks mm -hmm, because the efficacy is a little worse in the later weeks but it's not so high instead of being 97 8 percent effective at the 10 weeks and less if you add those two weeks on it goes down to like 92 percent. so that's still most women everything passes and you know there's not even any fetal tissue you can see when you're undergoing a natural miscarriage or medication induced miscarriage until about nine, 10 weeks, you might see what looks like tissue. So at 12 weeks, some people don't even see it because it's in a blood clot and they're on the toilet. And so above 12 weeks, we offer people a DNC or DNE because 
it's got fewer complications because retained placenta is bleeding and infection. And, and then you still have to do a procedure. You still have to go in with, give some sedation and do a DNC to remove that placental tissue to finish the procedure. So, so when that risk goes up a lot, then yeah. we don't give the medicine. So I guess the way I'm seeing this to bring it to the ER perspective, me working on a shift, like if I see a patient coming in with bleeding, who's pregnant, and I'm able to figure out that this patient is definitely headed towards uh, a miscarriage, or maybe they've uh, taken pills, so we know they're heading towards a miscarriage, or maybe we saw the prior, you know, we could see that they did have an IUP, and now they don't, or we could see that there's a non-viable pregnancy. If all of that, if any of those happen in the first trimester, it's reasonable to, for us, I don't know how to do the procedure. We could consult GYN, but we could also just say, look, this, here's the expectations. You could just go home and wait this out and come back if the bleeding's too heavy, um, but the bleeding could persist for a while or if you have any fevers. Um, you could, I could give you misoprostol right here to speed up the whole process. Or if you want, I could consult GYN and they could discuss possibly doing a procedure. That's our options in the first trimester. And it sounds mm -hmm. like the thing in the second trimester, what I'm taking from that is that I might say, all right, second trimester, I'm going to consult GYN and we're going to discuss, we're going to let them figure out surgery versus, you know, evacuation versus medication versus whatever. Right. And in that second trimester, if the patient, if you diagnose that the fetus has died, you've just done a sono and there's no FH, but she's not bleeding or cramping a lot. Maybe there was a little cramping or something brought her to the ER and you diagnose that the pregnancy has got no fetal heart for sure. And she's stable. There's no reason to keep her in the hospital. So you can have her come as an outpatient. If you have a good place for them to go for right. care the next day. Right. Or soon. One question I have is at what point is, you know, this idea of the missed abortion? In other words, at what point is the embryo or fetus in there so long that now that's a risk? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, is that when the patient spikes fevers? Is that when you know, mm -hmm. okay, this needs to come out now? Or is there something else that's like, oh, if this, if this, if these products remain in here for a week and it's not progressing, now I need to do something? Yeah. Um, that is a really good question. The retained tissue or missed miscarriage, there are people who, let's say they go to their OB who does a sono at nine weeks and there's no heartbeat. So they're saying, we're so sorry, the pregnancy's over. It can take up to four weeks. We don't do anything to them. Oh, wow. And the first study that tried to um, compare, you know, if you want to give people some counseling, because if you're going to give them all three choices, you have to give them effectiveness of each choice, not just what will the experience be like, but how successful. And our general counseling is that if you can wait up to a month and this is first trimester, then 70% of women will have a natural miscarriage that won't need any extra intervention. So 70%, but you have to wait that long. Is that the average time or that's like the far end time? Like Far end time, but okay. we can't predict who will go in a couple days or a couple weeks. Okay. So it's people who choose that route are really low intervention people. Okay. So we have to say to them, that's not dangerous, or I wouldn't give you that option, right? You don't, you wouldn't give that option if it was a bad idea, if it yeah. was clinically um, dangerous. Uh, the success of the pills was 80% 80, 80 pills alone, mesoprostol alone, with adding mifepristone, it's a little bit more effective. You get up to almost 90% success, and a, a DNC should be 100%. Like when I do a DNC, I know that I get the uterus empty. So that's, those are the choices. So some women are like, you know, 70% chance, uh, don't touch me, I'm good. I'm gonna go home and have my natural miscarriage. If I had one before, no problem. So having that tissue in there freaks out some patients and some doctors, you know, they're like, it's supposed to come out. It's gonna, you know, explode or, or make them infected. There's, there's no evidence for that. The infection risk happens when the cervix starts to open and the seal is is broken. Well, how do but you what, know if that's the case or not? If the... Well, they'd have to start bleeding 
or break their, you know, if they're in the second trimester, they might say, I broke my water. And then we don't let them, the tissue doesn't stay in there. So if they broke their water, they've started to miscarry, that's a whole different thing. Okay. So these are the people where you diagnose the fetal demise and nothing's going on. So that risk of infection, of ascending infection from the vagina up is almost non-existent. So then you can leave and them alone. Most of them will be bleeding for a long time. So bleeding is an issue, is a risk for infection now. If it's prolonged, if the cervix is open for a long time. So what we're talking about after a spontaneous abortion or medication abortion, you can have on and off bleeding that's up to even two weeks. That's different from when the cervix is open and you're really um, continually to bleed heavily over and over. So we usually will intervene because of the bleeding. Not really. It, it's not long enough for an infection. Okay. What I'm taking from that is like, there's not really this strict time of like, oh, the this pregnancy ended at nine weeks, but it's been three days and the products are still there. Like we got to get it out. Like you can let this ride for a long time in terms of yeah. risk of infection. If there's, yes. if there's, you know, too much bleeding, then that's a different story. Um, but that's really interesting to know. I did not know that at all. So, so when someone's in the second trimester, and the fetus is diagnosed as dead, we don't just say, you know, go home, it'll miscarry, because we know that those don't complete on their own. They need intervention. And we don't let it, you know, we let them process the loss, but we'll schedule them in the next few days because the longer that fetus, fetal tissue is in there dead, the risk of the surgical evacuation goes up. Mm -hmm. That's all second trimester stuff. And sometimes that happens because people don't get a sono and there are low intervention communities that will do a scan at, I don't know, 10 weeks and you don't get your other one until 20 weeks. You don't, it could be, they could have died anywhere in that six, seven, eight week window. But all of that is second trimester stuff. So then you'd always call an OBGYN to yeah. say, I think I just diagnosed a fetal demise. What should I do with, with this patient? So think, you know, all, think, all the I'm, early stuff is different. Yeah. I think what I'm taking from this is that like, as in the ER, in the first trimester, at least we, we kind of do know what we, you know, we can make some decisions there. Second trimester, definitely. I would not be wanting to make decisions. I'd want to consult you guys. Yeah. You could even, I mean, make it 12 and above or 10 weeks and above. But I would say 12, because you might have people who spontaneously have an abortion at home. And when they come to you, they're fine. And all you have to do is check clinically that they're done, check their ultrasound that they're done, check their blood type, offer them contraception and send them home. Um, when you say check the ultrasound and they're done, you're looking for it to just be a closed, like a uterus that has collapsed fully and is just back to being a stripe and you don't see anything in there. Right. Yep. And, um, you know, we used to m measure like how much, how thick or thin that endometrial stripe should be. We've really kind of moved away from that because there can be, you know, a centimeter of schmutz decidual cast in there that will all come out on its own. So as long as there's no, no clear pregnancy tissue so that the walls are against each other in the uterus and then then you have a complete abortion you've just diagnosed a complete abortion oh interesting so you guys don't care about an endometrial stripe anymore no we don't oh interesting okay that's actually also kind of evolved with the um increase in medication abortion because myself included i used to want to intervene if I knew there was a sac, I saw the patient two weeks ago, and now I see her for her follow-up. This is all in the outpatient setting. And the sac is gone, but I see some schmutz in there. I always wanted to take it out because that's what we always did is surgical evacuations. And it's such a fast, safe, simple procedure that you see that tissue in there. You kind of want to finish it off. And over time, we realized, you know, if you just leave her alone, it will finish off on its own. So you had to train yourself to not intervene on if the sack is out, she is done. Mm. Again, if she, her symptoms are done, right? So you can't treat the, the ultrasound picture is not your patient. The whole patient is your patient. So bleeding and cramping are done. 
ultrasound has no sac. There's a one or two centimeter schmutz. You can leave totally, you should leave it alone. I, yeah, it Love can it. make, I know, it's good. The uterus is uh, a magnificent organ, how it takes care of itself. And do you sort of, um, with these patients, are they going to get some sort of confirmation that it's done? Like, are you going to track an HCG or get an ultrasound later? Or if their symptoms finish, you're just not, you're just done. You're done. Um, one last question about this. Like, this is just something I've always wondered. How long is it normal for a UPREG to sort of stay positive after an event like this? Because that's yeah. an issue I've seen where it's like UPREG is still positive. I know you could distinguish with the serum HCG, but yeah, like what's a normal time frame where you're like, yeah, it's going to be. Way, we really learned that during the pandemic. So we give them a urine pregnancy test, the ones you just get at the regular old pharmacy. And you say, you can't do that. You do that test in four weeks and it should be negative. Mm. If it's still positive, maybe the medications didn't work. Okay. So you you know you have a, you have like two days of heavy bleeding. That's the peak of your miscarriage. You have some on and off bleeding for a week. Some people even spot for two weeks. Then you have two normal weeks. You do your pregnancy test. It has to be negative. Now there can be a few positives if you took your medications if you were ten weeks. So if you were a little further along, like the nine or ten weekers. Nice. They took actually five weeks for their urine preg to get negative. Five weeks. Oh wow! But if you were in Federal early rule of thumb, four weeks. Okay. Yeah. Four right. to five. Four to five weeks. If you're ten weeks or less, four to five weeks for your urine pregnancy test to be negative. This something you mentioned got, had me thinking about something you said before, like if we're talking about a spontaneous abortion in the first trimester, are there ever times where you are giving mifepristone in addition to misoprostol? That's um, only if the patient presents with no cramping and bleeding of her own. She hasn't started miscarrying on her own. And she says, I want the pills. And you then would give her mifepristone and mesoprostol, just like medical abortion, it has been shown that you give the mifepristone with the mesoprostol for, for early pregnancy loss and you make the medication approach more effective. So you can give her mesoprostol alone and get about an 82% success. Okay. You can give them both drugs and get a higher success for a, a non-viable pregnancy. So our protocols for terminating an early pregnancy or treating an early pregnancy loss where it's a dead pregnancy, non-viable. It's the same drugs, same, same doses, same everything. You have to get the mifepristone one day before the misoprostol. Right. For it but to if work optimally. If they're already bleeding, then you may just opt to do the misoprostol alone because you just want to flush it out. Yeah. And I think we don't have any data on whether the MIFI helps anything. Um, in that case, because once she's already bleeding, then you imagine that the embryo is probably already detached from the wall of the uterus. It's already starting to pass. You, you probably just, you don't help anything with the mifepristone and the mifepristone is supposed to, you're supposed to wait about 24 hours between the two drugs. She's already starting on her own. We just don't know if the mifepristone is going to give you any more bang for your buck. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, that's, that's super helpful. Uh, anything you wanted to add? Um, well, also with patients presenting with a miscarriage or early pregnancy loss, I think don't always assume those were desired pregnancies and the patient wanted to continue. Because if you look, we looked at our study of patients with EPL and a third of them were undesired, unplanned, undesired. And those aren't the same. Sometimes they're unplanned, but become desired. But so some of those patients may need contraception, might want that from you. Got it. And you can give them birth control pills. The only thing you need before starting the pill is blood pressure check and a history. No thromboembolic past, no cardiovascular past, normal BP, give the pills if they want it. Love it. Thank you so okay. much. You're so welcome. It was good to talk to you, Ovir. Yeah, you too.